Good morning, everyone. All right, everybody's nice and awake this morning. That's great. Well, thanks for joining us here in person. And those of you watching us online, we're so glad that you could join us today. I'm Pastor Jess, and I'm one of the pastors here at Quest. Uh, before we get into announcements, I would like to bring your attention to the Connect card that's inside your bulletin. If you're watching online right now, you can find a digital um, link to a digital copy of that card. But if you would take a moment to fill that Connect card out, let us know that you are here. That'd be great. There's a place on the back for any prayers or praises that you may have. And if you are visiting for the first time, we would love if you would let us know that. And I'll send you a free gift in the mail. No strings attached. Well, we have a couple announcements to go over today. The first up is next Sunday, I'm sorry, next Saturday, is Big Serve. And we're going to be going over to Green Hills, and we are going to be extending a hand, sharing a smile, and connecting with those over there. So what's going to happen is we're going to have two teams. We're going to have a team that's going to go wash all the windows of the independent living residents in their apartments. I think there's over 200 windows that we're going to wash, but it should take us about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And then there's going to be a second team who in the afternoon is going to put on a carnival for the assisted living residents. And we're really excited to go in there. I've been in talks with those at Green Hills, and they said that this is just an absolute blessing to, to their residents there. So if you would like to join us, you can join one or both teams. Um, you can sign up at the resource counter, and I would love to have you come and serve alongside of us. And this is a great opportunity to bring your kids too. So lots of serving opportunities. So be sure to check that out. Next up, we'll be holding infant and child dedications happening on April 21st. If you're interested in having your infant or child dedicated, um, just let April know. This is an opportunity for you as a parent to stand before the church and to um, make the commitment to raise your child in a house that knows Jesus. This is slightly different from baptism, but we would love to, to take that step of your journey with you if you're interested. So again, let April know at info at questchurchonline.com if you would like to participate. Next up is pizza with the staff. So if you have been here for six months or less, that is for you. This is an opportunity for you to come and meet the staff at Quest, hear about Quest, ask some questions. And best of all, lunch is going to be on us. So if you've been here six months or less, we invite you to join us on Sunday after second service on April 28th for pizza. You can sign up at the resource counter or use the QR code um, if you would like to join us. And lastly, um, Quest is going to be hosting Jason David on Thursday, April 25th. And um, Jason David actually came here, I think it was last year, and he's a three times cancer survivor. He has an amazing story, an amazing testimony to God. And he puts on a show. And um, I came to his last show here, and it was really good. It's for all ages. You will be encouraged and blessed by it. This is a free event. Invite your friends, and it's for all ages. So if you're interested in coming to that, mark your calendar for April 25th and come join us for Jason David. And if you came to his last show, please know this is a brand new show um, that he has put together. So we're looking forward to that. Well, again, thank you for being here today. And at this time, Pastor Clark is going to come up and we are going to take in some members. So I'd like to invite uh, Hillary and Aaron, come on forward if you would stand here in front of me. So uh, we take folks into membership, and what that means is people have made this step to uh, just stand here and face me, uh, have uh, taken the step the, to decide that uh, this is where they're going to fully invest and, in ministry and receive ministry. And uh, I know that both of these have been involved uh, in things like special events. I know uh, Hillary's involved in things in the children's department, and we're looking forward to some things on the horizon that as far as ways they can be involved. And so we're pretty excited about some of the opportunities that may be uh, on the horizon. But they've taken the step to go through the membership class, and they have committed to uh, these things. Now, this is just a, a wrap-up of what we've talked about. But first of all, uh, if you would answer yes, if you can, to these things, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Yes, yes. I agree to pray for, support Quest, its people, staff, and leaders, and feel that God's call is to a whole life stewardship by supporting Quest with my time, talent, and regular giving. Is that yes? Yes. yes. Uh, I recognize my ongoing need to grow in God's grace through weekly worship, prayer, personal Bible study, a small group, and other types of discipleship. Is that true? Do you recognize that? Yes. yes. 
Uh, I am in harmony with the doctrines of the Church of the Nazarene and the beliefs. Is that yes? Yes. yes. And so the, uh, based on those four questions and based on the class that you went through and the study that you did there, we as a congregation take you into membership and uh, we welcome you as a formal part of the body of Quest. Can we just say welcome as we... So thanks for being here. You can return to your seat. If you, I would say if you haven't met them yet, uh, find them in the lobby and um, introduce yourself and give them your name, trade names, and uh, as you, we welcome them officially. But would you stand with us together? The sunshine has brought us in with smiles. God is so good, and we are ready to connect with him and who he is. Gotta dance in the darkness, sing through the fire, praise when it don't make sense. And sometimes you gotta stare down the giant, worship from the lion's den. Sometimes you gotta shout it from the mountain, louder in the valley, trusting that it's gonna get you there. Sometimes you gotta welcome the wonder. Wait for the answer Worship with your hands in the air I praise you anywhere Praise, give him praise, give him praise In the highest praise Give him praise, give him praise In the highest He is worthy Yes, he is worthy of all of our praise Sometimes you've got to dance the prison, cry out to heaven, shout until the doors swing wide. Sometimes you've got to stand in your shackles, brave in the battle, worship with your hands held high. I'll praise you anywhere. Praise, give them praise, give them praise in the highest praise. Give them praise, give them praise in the highest he Give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy, yes, he is worthy of all of our praise. He is worthy, he is faithful. Sing faithful all my life. blessings day and night. Countless reasons why I praise you anywhere. Every promise kept, goodness every step, each and every breath. I praise you anywhere, faithful all my life. Blessings day and night, countless reasons why I praise you anywhere. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest praise. Give him praise, give him praise in the highest. He is worthy, yes, he is worthy of all of our praise. I praise you anyway, yes, I will. Oh, mountain, oh, valley, I know that you're. Praise you anywhere. God, you are good. Worthy of our praise this morning. And no matter what we've brought into this place, whether we're on a mountaintop or standing in the valley of the shadow of death, we will praise you and lift your name. God, from a place of gratitude in our hearts. For you are good.
and your love endures forever. our voices. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy of me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a light inside of these lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Don't you get shy of me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a light I know it's not much, I'm 
nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing a song to you as we love you. And we love you. And we know that your return is soon. We can feel it. There's a day coming yeah. when the old will pass away and every wrong will be made right no darkness no night the sun will lie away can you imagine there's a king coming One who conquered death and grave and No more pain and no more sorrow It's hope for tomorrow It's our hope for today And he who was He who is He who to come, Christ the Son of Man, riding on the clouds with a crown upon his head. Every eye will see him with the nail scars in his hand. a sign he's getting closer Jesus he's on the move yes he is his story has been written oh Son of man, riding 
Jesus come but until that day may we be strong and focused on the work that we have to do amen amen great singing this morning praise God you can be seated oh that was powerful God is here and some of you wanted to express yourself with a physical amen go ahead and let's just say Thank you, Lord, for being here. And we say that with our bodies, as the psalmist has said, as we put our, our hands and our hearts together. Our goal this morning is that we walk out of here a little bit more in love with Jesus and a little bit more in love with one another. Because when that takes place, we are transformed from the inside out. Just a little bit at a time, sometimes a lot at a time. But I'm looking forward to what God has in store for us. Can we pray together? Jesus, you have uh, been here. Your presence and your spirit has settled in. And we have engaged you. And in doing so, all the cares of the world that seems to be at war in us and at us has faded just a little bit. The tensions of the world and the tensions of our life have have started to be put in place as we engage you and who you are and invite you in with great faith, knowing that you have a plan as we have sung. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. This morning we start a four-week series called Better Together. And the idea is simple, and that is that we are going to celebrate the body of Christ. We're going to get excited and we're going to enjoy this gift that God has given us. And it's a place for us to live. It's not as much as a physical place. Oftentimes we'll think of the church. It's so funny. Uh, I've been having uh, some uh, spring kicks and I've been having some allergies. So I may not have the prettiest voice. And so uh, as I was going into uh, worship this morning, I said, Clark, whatever you do, don't sing. I couldn't help it. <laughs> have you ever been in a game and you, just, you, know, you end up shouting and the next day you don't have much left? So anyway, if I don't get pretty, just listen closer, all right? So I, I'm excited because in this series, we, we think about what God has gifted us in the body of Christ. He's given us a place to live. It's not a physical place. We oftentimes think of the church as this building, but he's given us a place to live in the lives of one another. And sometimes that's countercultural. Sometimes we live in a culture that's kind of self-reliant, a culture where you do your thing and leave me alone and I'll do my thing. And we try and have mutual respect from a distance. Uh, but God has designed for us to live together. And it's, it's not just that it's this design he has put in us and imposed upon us. No, God delights in how he made us. He delights in that. He gave each of us a small sliver of the many gifts that he has. He is a dynamic God that is good at a lot of things. And each of us, he gives us this itty bitty sliver of some of the gifts that he has so that we can experience those gifts and use those gifts as he would. God wants us to express himself to others by using those gifts. And that brings us to the point number one. Our first idea, that's the big idea, but underneath the big idea is this idea of synergy. 
Now, synergy is a word that kind of came up through the business world, but uh, anything that's true, by the way, in the business world, if it's true, it came from God. And uh, I believe that the, the core of what synergy means is found in Scripture. And so synergy is, is created when the Holy Spirit transforms individuals and works through them individually and then also works through those individuals as a group. Working through us both individually and as a group maximizes the impact of every contribution, no matter how small, no matter how seemingly insignificant. So we'll give a straight out synergy noun uh, definition. The interaction or cooperation of two or more people, organizations, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of the separate parts. Now, I'm not sure what the new math says, but here's what I know. I know that two plus two equals four, okay? So what does synergy say? What does synergy say in the body of Christ? In the body of Christ, it says two plus two equals more than the sum of the two parts. It could be five, it could be six, it could be anything. And so the idea is if God who gave you gifts, God who gave me gifts, and if he puts us together and the Holy Spirit gets involved, what does God bring to the table? Well, I think it's something like this, right? I don't know. Infinity? Is that infinity? The sky's the limit. And here's the story that I love that starts to demonstrate this. I love this story, and it's kind of a negative story. Does that make sense? It's kind of a bad story, but it's hilarious. Okay. Uh, so I've got to go to Genesis. And in Genesis 11, it's uh, God is talking in the scriptures uh, as the historian has captured what has taken place in this city. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. So uh, this was a very prideful people. They wanted to build a great city, and they had pretty much all the materials and the talent to do it. And so they were building the city to bring glory to themselves and to bring glory to their leaders. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Can you think about that for a second? Without God, there is still enough residual image of God in us that if people can get unified, almost anything's possible. Even if God isn't involved, just just if we could get unified. You know, in some ways, it's, it's good that people can't get unified. Because apart from God, we can't really love one another. Apart from God, we can't truly be unified. If you look at the world and what's going on in the world right now, we're not very unified. But if groups of people could operate in the design of God. They, they can accomplish so much. And this is showing us even apart from God, just based on the residual image of God in us, that's possible. And to some extent I say, how much more possible is it than when God is involved? Powerful statement. If as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do is impossible to them. Come, come. Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth and they stopped building the city. And that is why it is called Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. Uh, Probably something's, I probably should go see a therapist. Something's wrong with me. Uh, I don't have nightmares. I, I have one nightmare that I remember. I don't know if I told you this before. I think in the early 2000s, a movie came out called Arachnophobia. It was about, you know, a horror film about spiders. And I'm not particularly scared of spiders, but I, I just remember the night after watching that, um, I was laying in bed and uh, something took place in my mind and I had this nightmare and from that flat position, I was able to leap six feet in the air, throw off the covers, 
scale over Rose without touching her and got to the light switch all in just about a half a second and turned on the lights and just was, uh, there were no spiders there, but I thought there were. But here's what's weird about, I, I have night comedies, and this actually drives Rose more crazy. I have night comedy. I wake up laughing. I, I just laughing, and I, I'm just crying, and I have this image in my mind, and I shake, and I try not to laugh, and you know what happens when you try not to laugh? You just, you know, and, and Rose said, would you shut up? You know, let me. Uh, and so sometimes when I read this passage, I will just imagine this story so vividly. And, and it, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this. Have you ever uh, talked to somebody that doesn't know your language and how you just get very articulated in speaking your own language as though that's going to help? And then you get louder and louder and as if that's going to help. And I, I just imagine the scene. And I just think it's hilarious, all these people speaking the language they thought they've always spoken, and the other person think, speaking the language they thought they've always spoken and they can't communicate. And I, I, will, I will just wake up laughing about this, this image. I, does God have a sense of humor? Absolutely. The idea that it, all he needed to do was to confuse their language and disrupt their design, and they could no longer accomplish anything. This whole idea of synergy, that God designed us just simply as human beings, that when we gather together and bring our gifts together, that two plus two equals more. And in the body of Christ, when he brings us together, two plus two can equal unimaginable things because of what God brings to the table. And that is supposed to happen, folks, every week. Every week. That is a part of life in the body of Christ. The sum of each part added together, plus the amplifying boost of the Holy Spirit working through each member of the team and through the group as a whole, and boom, synergy and great things can happen. You say, wow, I'd like to see that. <laughs> well, if you spend any time in the body of Christ, you will see that. It, hap it has happened in the history of Quest. It is happening right now in Quest. So many things have taken place just in, in the time that I've been here and even before in the last year. What we've done recently is we put together a, a transition team A and a transition team B, and we've been uh, working with the staff as a team and working with the church board as a team. And, and these four different teams are having kind of the same three conversations. And out of the assessment, we put our minds together and say, how do we address this? And, and Team A is looking at, at uh, what, what are the ministries of Quest and what are the needs out in our community. They're fanning out and having conversations with prosecutors and social workers and educators and saying, what are you seeing? What, what, what are the reoccurring needs in the lives of people that are making their lives stressful and miserable? We have a team B that's looking at some of our barriers. What's holding us back? God keeps sending us more and more people, and so we might need to think about what's getting in the way. So we're looking at things like parking, and we're looking at building use, and, uh, you know, times of services, everything. How do, how do we brainstorm through that? Primary conversation for the board is, who are we as Quest? Can we define ourselves? to the point that we can clearly articulate, not only to those in the community, but eventually, at some point, later this year, can we eventually articulate ourselves to a candidate to be our new leader so they can help us decide if they're a fit or not. We're trying to think about what God is doing in the midst of all that. I believe God's already at work in those teams. We, 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 uh, we sensed... Uh, at the end of last year and earlier this year, that one of our primary concerns was 6th through 8th grade as we were graduating kids into the sanctuary and said, man, that, 
that doesn't feel quite right. We feel like we need an age-graded focus on Sunday mornings for this group to help them develop at their age level. And so I don't know what else to do, but we just prayed and said, God, what do we do? So we put people in a room and we pray. We put more people in another room and we pray. And eventually a team of eight adults rose up and said, we feel like we're called to take this on. I don't know what the attendance is up there, but you'll see them oftentimes coming down and participating in worship and standing across the back. And so if you're coming in, and uh, some folks will, will come in and think that they're standing room only because there's a bunch of people back here. The, the room that we gave them isn't that big, and they, they've packed it out. They're now doing both services. They're having monthly activities. There's synergy in that team. They each brought their their little piece, and together things are happening. And Easter, five of them accepted Christ. Last weekend, another accepted Christ. That room is full. Full. There's no more room. (laughs) We got a quote, $10,800 to take out that wall and put in the windows that need to be there so that we can maybe get a little bit more space. We're hitting our our head on barriers. God's sending us people. Things are happening. There's synergy when we bring our gifts together and God's in it. Anything can happen. God's designed for you and I to live this way, to live in groups, to live in the body of Christ, to love God and to express that love in our love for one another. I'm amazed by the teams here. There's a cleaning team, a security team, a kitchen team, a care team. There's multiple prayer teams. There's a lawn care team, by the way, that do amazing. There's a maintenance team. There's kids' ministry teams, youth ministry teams, worship teams, tech teams discipleship teams, small groups, small group leaders. And I'm sure there's so many teams here I've, I've missed somebody. We, have, uh, we had an amazing extravaganza. The, uh, we were looking at that model, and going into the model, I was thinking, I, I think this is the last year for this model. We're going to have to do something totally different. I think we've maxed out. They had made a few tweaks in their planning based on last year. We had about the same amount we'd had before, but it went so much better. That model can take another 150 or 200 people. We can do it like that again next year before we hit our head probably. Many of you were involved in that. Our Christmas Eve was in top one or two in attendance. Our Our Easter, I think, was number two in attendance in the history of Quest. And so we we look at what God is doing as we participate together in teams. And we may think what I have to give and offer isn't that much. But it is. It is. And God planned for you and I to build relationships in these teams and to enjoy one another and enjoy what it is he's called us to do. So I'm just going to give you a bunch of scriptures. We're going to, for about the next four minutes, we're just going to read a bunch of scriptures. And in doing so, we're going to get a sense of the continuity of scripture, how important this principle is. But I want you to think about one thing, and and I, I, I include this in looking at the story of Babel that we just read, but life lived this way in the body of Christ, It's fun. It's fun for you. And have you considered that it's fun for God? Have you thought about God having fun? I think God is designed himself to have fun. And he enjoys and delights how the teams work together, how he knits everything together, and how that is fulfilling for you and fulfilling for me. He gives you like I said, a slice of his giftedness, and he enjoys 
when you use that giftedness for the glory of God and for the good of the kingdom. So stick with me. Here we go. 2 Corinthians 13.5. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Romans 8, 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, though even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who also lives in you, life. 2 Corinthians 4.11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Life. You have been crucified. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Description of life. Galatians 4.19, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. This wonderful life in the body of Christ that helps us mature and grow in our relationship with Christ. Ephesians 3.16 and 19, I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Describing life. In 2 Thessalonians, it says, That day he will come to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. When we work as God designs us, when we allow him to live through us, when we operate in our design, God is delighted. God has fun. God really delights in the body of Christ when we work together as it should and when his spirit is allowed to unify us. The Holy Spirit powers synergy. And that's just one principle. Let's go to point two. Here's a trickier one. This is not as much my favorite. Balance. God designed us to live in balance. And he only gave us 24 hours a day. That's it. 24 hours a day. How many of you ever wish for 25 or 26 sometimes? Only 24. And because we only have 24 hours, And because there's so many good things that we could do, we have to prioritize. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm prone to obsess on something. You know, I'm in the, uh, (laughs) I'm at the age when I remember when video games first came out. Anybody remember Pong? Pong? And as that grew into uh, all these complicated games and computer games and things that uh, could absolutely captivate you, I remember in my 20s that uh, um, at, at night the only computer I had was at church. So at night, like 11 o'clock, I would be in there trying to play a flight simulator, and I would lose track of time. That's part of, that's part of ADHD sometimes. You just lose track of time. And I'll look up, and the janitor's there who comes in at 6 o'clock going, what are you doing here? And my, my hand won't come off of the controller. And, and I, I could get stuck obsessing on things. I can get captivated by uh, ideas, by interesting things. And I'll lose track of time. And their balance will start to fade from my life. 
And while some of the things that I'm investing myself in, a lot of them are good things, out of balance they bring damage to other things in my life. And you've probably experienced that. So this principle of balance is, a, is the idea that God actually calls us to balance within our lives. So, so we don't tend to have issues trying to minimize bad things and amplify good things. We tend to have issues choosing between multiple good things and trying to figure out what is God's plan for my life and how is balance supposed to come to my life. Ice cream is a good thing. A good thing. But it needs to be in balance. So my grandma, uh, on my dad's side, she was a uh, basically a farm wife, and every conversation to you was like she was yelling to the barn, and she was just kind of gruff, and she scared me when I was little. Uh, but the one of the things I loved about grandma is that it, 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 the family gatherings, there would be one night where it was just ice cream. That was supper, and that was amazing. Now, it took a little bit of work because they would line up all of these, you know, the crank ice cream things. They would line them up, and then they would take all of my nieces and nephews, and they would make these little lines be behind each of them. And so you would get up, and you would crank until your little arm wore out, and then you would tap up, and you'd go to the end of the line. And the next one, and you would just keep going until, you know, one of the uncles with the salt and the ice would say, it's enough, it's ready. And they're all different types of flavors. There was strawberry. She would, Peach, she said, it's, tonight's going to be peaches and cream, and I get excited. That's all we'd have. That was supper. That was exciting. The, uh, uh, it's not good if that were supper every night. So uh, my mother-in-law, when we lived in the suburbs of Chicago, was starting to get dementia, and she could no longer live on her own, and so uh, we folded her into our home. We actually went and bought a home uh, that would allow uh, her and my two daughters and my wife all to li live together. And uh, there's different stages if you've had a dementia patient. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can be, just so you know, a little bit funny. It can be funny. So in the middle of the night, and I wake up easy, and so in the middle of the night, I would hear her door open and she would walk down the hallway and I would hear a, a, a spoon clank against a bowl. And um, she was getting a bowl of ice cream. And she would go back to her room, and she would eat it, and then she'd come back down, and she'd wash out the bowl so we wouldn't know and put it back. And uh, so I'd fall back asleep, and then a little while later, I'd hear her walking down the hallway. I'd hear the clink of a bowl. She'd get another bowl of ice cream. And so uh, then she'd walk back up. And so what's happening with Jane, my mother-in-law, she would, she would kind of lay there in bed, and she would go, I have a hankering for ice cream. I just have a taste for ice cream. She'd get up and get a bowl, and a few minutes later, she forgot she had a bowl of ice cream. And she, I, I kind of like have a. I can almost taste it. I have a taste for ice cream. And she'd get up and she'd do that all night. And so uh, the next morning, she would go. Those girls eat so much ice cream. <laughs> we can have ice cream. We need to have our diets in balance. It's got to be in balance. And I don't know why God designed us that way, but it is. It's so. When I obsess on things, something will lose. Something will lose. And it could be good things I'm obsess obsessing on. And too many times it's been my family that lost, but we, we battle that. We battle that as parents, as we're trying to build careers, and as we're trying to think through things, we're trying to think, through, how do I prioritize? And we'll do this list, and we'll say, you know, God is my first priority, my family is second, and then there's others, and then me. And we understand this list. We're prioritizing relationships. But the list is dysfunctional. It doesn't work. So why, why do you say that? Well, okay. Little Timmy has been working on a piano recital for all year. It's time for Timmy to have his piano recital. And uh, yet there's some uh, conflict at the church where as part of the kingdom, really need to be in this meeting, but it's Timmy's only recital of the year. Let me consult my list. Well, okay, I'm going to go and be a part of that meeting. 
So somebody else in our family or maybe there's a person who has a, a need that's in conflict with something that maybe we would normally invest in and, and we have to think, well, how do I sort through the, oh, well, I'll, I'll go do the God thing or the church thing. And so we can even get out of balance when it comes to church or our relationship with God being a good thing. It, it can focus our minds in, in the wrong way that, that is against balance. And so what is God calling us to do? God is calling us to, to put all of our priorities on a wheel. And at certain moments and certain seasons, God will ask us to spin certain things to the top as our priority, and, and in doing that, we can come into balance. Say, so, well, that's, that's tough. Can I, just have, can I just have rules? I can do rules. This is hard. This, this is easier. But this brings balance. So, well, how do I know when to spin? <laughs> Christ living in you. That's the beauty of Christ living in you. Same thing happens to us that happened with the Pharisees. Just give me a list of rules, and I've got it from here. I don't need you, God, in my life. Just give me the rules. And he's calling us to a life of full color and balance and fulfillment. It says, let me live in and through you, and let's together spin this wheel into a life of balance. Now, the list can be helpful sometimes. Your wife or spouse comes to you and says, hey, don't forget, this weekend my parents are coming, and you go, ah, but God, God. <laughs> this is tougher. I know it's tougher. It's more dynamic. It requires a relationship with Christ. So we do the wheel, we put our priorities that he's called us to on there, and in relationship with Christ on a daily basis, we ask God to help us come into balance. Say, that is tough. I have a hard enough time hearing God as it is, and now you want me to hear God this way. I know, I know. But see, God, God wants us to live in tension between good things so that you can find balance in your life we live in tension between good things, not going all the way over here, all the way over here, but trying to manage them. And the reason he wants us to live in tension is so that we are dependent on him to help make our way forward. You say, well, I can do it. No, you can't. We stink as humans at prioritizing our lives. We just do. God didn't design you so that you could take a formula or a list of rules and pull away from him and self-determine the rest of your life. That's not the design. The design is living in it for you. God wants to be your, you know, GPS, global priority service, whatever you want to call it. Your GPS or your priorities is, is your relationship with him. So if you want to be a rule follower, here's how you be a rule follower. Invest in the disciplines of the Spirit. And in doing so, you will become so close to Christ that you will hear his voice loud and clear. Read the word daily. Worship through your seven-day worship cycle. Not only do you have a, a moment there you are in the word, worshiping with him, but also this corporate moment where you gather in and something unique happens once every seven days. Pray constantly, but also pray in dedicated moments that are set aside for just you and Jesus to talk. Give of your time to others. That's got to be in balance. Give of your time to those that don't know Christ. That's got to be a part of the balance. Give of your pocketbook, of your treasure, to the ministries of the church where God has placed you. That's part of the balance. Be in close fellowship with other believers. And this last discipline is our point number three. Share your life with other believers so that you can see God more clearly. We want to take things into isolation and figure life out on our own. God did not design us to do that. He designed us to be together. People from outside of your inside 
will have a perspective on you that helps you. I have to be in fellowship with people who love God and love me because I can't depend only on my view of me and the world. His plan for you is to share your life with others so that he can speak externally into your life and so he can speak internally to other lives through you. That's the design. It's a culture of edification. And it, it, it's, it's a lot of conversations that say this, I see in you. I love text language. You know text language, how you abbreviate? It says, I see in you. And so when we're in groups of people that love one another, we lovingly say to others, here's what I see in you. Here's what I see God doing in you. You may not have noticed it. And we edify one another. We live together. We lift one another up. We help each other with blind spots. And we challenge one another. I believe the reason for God's plan of salvation and the painful sacrifice he was willing to make it was to complete this plan so that God could once again dwell in the environment that he loves the most, your heart. And for you to be the healthiest person that God designed you to be, you need to be in a body of believers, the body of Christ. If we reject God's desire to live in us, our lives get very small. But if we accept God's desire, embrace his desire, to live in us, our lives get big. They explode with color, value, impact, vibrance, synergy, joy. Life can be fun no matter how rough or challenging it is. You want to fully experience God, Romans 12. 12 1, many of you have memorized this verse. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Let him spin the wheel. Do it in conversation. Living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Pursue God. Pursue how God has designed you to fit into the body of Christ. He will lead you to a place of serving that fits you. And you will find your heart expanding. You can love more than you love now. You can love him more. You can love others more. You can love life more. If you try to fit in like somebody else, you'll be frustrated. There's a lot of frustration and anxiety in living outside the body of Christ and in trying to figure out your own priorities on your own. But there's peace and there's power within the body of Christ. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. I'd like to ask the band to come up and let's stand together, shall we? Let's bow our heads. Here's the prayer for today. Dear God, am I willing to give you all of me so that we can do this life thing together. You lead, I'll follow. Dear Lord, fill me up, and I, I will pour myself out wherever and however you desire. If there is anything that prevents you from fully dwelling in me, I give you permission in advance of me knowing what it might be. I give you permission to help me remove it through your power. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's worship together. The weapon may be formed but it won't prosper and when the darkness falls it won't prevail 
Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph Cause my God will never fail My God will never fail And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory Oh, the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord oh. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus Oh, every war he wages he will win I'm not backing down from any giant no. Cause I know how this story ends And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory enemy meant for evil you turn it for good you turn it for good yeah you take what the enemy meant for evil you turn it for good you turn it for good come on sing it you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for Now, there is reasons for anxiety. Sometimes we have, in our own bodies, chemical reasons that produce anxiety. Sometimes we get out of balance physically. There are reasons for anxiety. So I do not mean to, in any way, minimize those sorts of ideas and those realities. But I'm telling you that anxiety is minimized when we function within the body of Christ. It focuses us on things that are bigger than us. And it gathers us together to accomplish things that are bigger to, than us. My prayer for you this week is, and my challenge to you is, don't let the things of this world, plenty of things to be worried about. I encourage you, pray for Israel. Pray for Israel. 
as their enemies seek to wipe them off the earth. There's plenty, of, but, but don't let that interrupt you growing in love for one another and for God. The enemy will want to cause anxiety to the point that it interrupts your ability to grow in love for one another and for God. So sure, pray. Pray for peace. That's a great thing. But here's my blessing. May the Holy Spirit give you the power to grow in love with one another and with him this week, regardless of the external anxieties you come across in this world. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being here.